26. <laughs> Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew. Um, I'm going to show you what regular human 2020 vision is like. So turn with me to Matthew 2020. <clears throat> and you know, man has 2020 vision, right? But God's vision is way better than that. <clears throat> way better than that. So that's why Matthew 2020 shows you man's man's vision turn to matthew 20 verse 20. <clears throat> then came to him the mother of zebedee's children with her sons now who is zebedee's children james, what, and, john. james and john very good so the, so james and john's mama or mommy came to Jesus. Okay, then came to Jesus, the mother of Zebedee's children, with her sons. So she brought them with her. Okay? And she was worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. Folks, this is manipulation. Okay? You know what she's going to ask. Don't you? You know what she's going to ask. But she's worshiping him and am desiring of him a certain thing. I am telling you, a whole lot of people worship Jesus, honor Jesus and stuff, and they've got ulterior motives at work that cause them to do that, hoping that they will get favor with him based on their appropriate behavior because they're worshiping Jesus and they're coming to Jesus. But they're, they've got one primary reason why they're really coming to him and it's not to worship him. That one primary reason is to get something from Jesus. <clears throat> All right. Some people would call her a good mom. She has 20-20 vision. She has man's way of viewing things. She has Matthew 20, 20 vision. Verse 21 says, And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she saith unto him, <clears throat> Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy kingdom. All right, so she doesn't really want much. <laughs> she just wants them to have the top two spots under Jesus. And she thinks that they're going to get that because mama came to Jesus. Yeah. <clears throat> Let me tell you a little thing about Jesus. He can see right through our motives. Remember, he looks on the heart or the seat of motivation. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because. Right. Because she didn't ask anything in verse 20. But he figured it out because he can tell. He reads us. You know, we're the ones always shocked when bad stuff comes out of us. We're the ones that go, oh, my God. Oh, you know, and go freaking out. And he's going, you've always been that way. You know, you just manifested it in a manner where you can see it right now. He knows what we are in ourselves, but he also knows what we are in the resurrection. I say it like that because uh, our true state is what we are in the resurrection, not how good we're doing at the moment. That's our true state. <clears throat> and it's important that we keep that in mind because if we don't, then we begin to judge ourselves by how our day or week went and how well we reacted to the Lord or reacted for the Lord or whatever. And then we get discouraged about ourselves. <clears throat> okay. If the Lord doesn't give up on you, you shouldn't give up on you. Okay. Is that a good? If the Lord doesn't give up on you, 
when the Lord comes to you and says, I'm getting off the throne because you were seated with me there and I don't want you anymore. The day he comes and tells you that, that's when you can start freaking out. <clears throat> All right, so let's drop down to verse 24. Uh, and, and before I read it, let me let you know that the other 12, uh, 10 disciples were listening to this whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> and they saw Mama come. <coughs> and now you got to remember, this is James and John. Their Mama is asking this, if we can sit on his right hand and on his left. And there's ten over here, and one of those is Peter. He's not in the two. He's over here. And Peter is not going to be up there next to Jesus? You think that's, that's going to go with, yeah. <laughs> with Brother Peter? I think, I think he's going to have a problem with it, and I think the rest of them are too. Okay? So verse 24, and when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. You could say they were hacked off. They didn't like this sort of what we used to call schmoozing. <clears throat> they didn't like that. And so Jesus now notices that there's a split. You know, just for the video, I want to make sure everybody understands this is not a Coca-Cola. This is Gatorade. I'm going to start eating and drinking healthy now that I've pretty much ruined my life for 40 years or 50, 50 years, 60. How old am I? 60 years. It's sort of a bad time to start <laughs> trying to turn the ship, isn't it? <clears throat> anyway, but Jesus called them unto him and said. So <clears throat> Jesus notices that the, that the group is having problems and divisions are starting. All right. Now, how would you handle this? Would you say, first of all, you know, you 12 and mama, get over here. Mama, don't be doing this anymore. This is manipulation. He never said a word of that. He didn't say to the two, don't you think that's rather, rather heady of you to think that you're above Peter or anybody else, that you're supposed to be, you know? And what sort of deal is this? He didn't, he didn't address it like that. <clears throat> but, is the word though, but Jesus called them unto him and said, <clears throat> you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise dominion authority over them but it shall not be so among you all right if we let's just stop right there Jesus is saying look this is the way the world works and the world does work that way right that if you are someone great in the world your greatness is proven by how many people are under you or by how many people serve you right Am I, I mean you know that's why these CEOs of these big huge corporations get millions and millions and billions of dollars because everybody serves them and they're asked to cut back and to give up you know, one day a week salary so that they can continue. They never do that, you know. And there's a reason. Because they are great. And we are not. Okay. That's the way it works in the world. But folks, that's only a mentality. That's only the way that it's been set up and we've all accepted that. Now, it's based on selfishness, but... It's just a system that's been set up. Of course, it's, it's followed by our own pride and ego and what have you. <clears throat> so then, verse 26, but it shall not be so among you, 
But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Now, first of all, the word minister means what? Servant. Servant. Okay. So, so basically what we're saying, remember this is preparations for starting a ministry. Being a minister 101 is not great as the world understands it. It's not coming into greatness as the world understands it. Do you understand what I'm saying? To truly be a minister as God wants you to be will not result in greatness as the world understands it. Now, let me just stop and interject my, my past experience I remember hearing this. I remember reading this early and going, wow, that's different. And I remember thinking, that's cool. You know, of course, now it was, it was back in the 60s when I came to the Lord. So it was cool that the man wasn't in control. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, so I, it's like, oh, yeah, this is right down hippie lane. Here comes Santa Claus, right down hippie lane. Um, but I... I remember when I started getting put in a position where I began to be leased and I hadn't finished reading the scriptures. And I remember not liking it. And yet my philosophy, my theology, my doctrines were right. But, but when you put me in that situation, I didn't like it. Now, let's finish reading so we can get the full gist of that. <clears throat> Verse 27, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Sorry? You may. In the NAS, yes. Yeah, that's that's good. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm gonna don't turn there, but I'm gonna read Matthew 23, verse 11 and 12. It says, "But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted." All right. I'm wondering what is the definition of exalted if he exalts you. I mean, in light of his definition of greatness here. I'm starting to question if I want to be exalted. <laughs> the, the fact that you responded lets me know that you understand exactly what I said. Yes? Amen. You didn't catch that. Mallory said, scripture where Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw a man. And we said, yay, I want to be lifted up. But he was talking about dying on the cross and so you know he said he that shall be the greatest shall be your servant <clears throat> and in other places he talks about being made the least uh, and that he that is least shall be greatest <clears throat> and so I remember you know believing these scriptures and when I say that, I want, to, I want to always point out that there is a time when I believe the scriptures theologically, but it has absolutely no effect in my life. That is not good. <clears throat> but I remember when God began to exalt me to the position of least, which would be the greatest. I mean, it, it could be a little confusing, but it's, it's, if he says he's going to exalt you, he's going to exalt you to being the greatest. But the greatest in his kingdom is being the least, the one who serves and whatever. <clears throat> and I remember as he began to do that, and he began to put me in positions where I would look bad and people would think bad of me and that stuff was being said that wasn't, at all true and yet I was becoming the least 
And I remember reacting over that, not liking that, because, you know, which is just the opposite of what Jesus said. Look, here's the way it's going to be in my kingdom. Greatness, he's, here's what the Lord is saying. You, as the world, say that greatness is when everybody serves you. I say a truly great person serves everybody else. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, as far as the understanding of it, just the head understanding of it? Maybe I'll say it again. He's saying you, as far as how the world thinks, says greatness is how many people can serve you. But I say greatness is how many people you serve. And so, to him, a, it's, it's not a great person that can take a high position. It's not a great person that can take a large salary. It's not a great person that can have a wonderful reputation and nobody ever question it. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not a great person that can do that, folks. Anybody that's worth anything has gone through major stuff and greatness has been proven by their reaction to that. And now we understand, and let's make this clear, the only truly great person is Christ as far as this world is concerned. But it is supposed to be Christ in us. We can go through all of these things. Uh, I was thinking about it today. I was thinking when Jesus said stuff like... Um, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. If that was said to Jesus, he wouldn't have any problem with that. Right? If it was said to Jesus, you must become the least, he wouldn't have any problem with that. Am I right or wrong? But everybody else would at some juncture. Okay? So the only hope of humanity is for a new humanity or a new life in human flesh, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the only hope for anybody. I don't care how great you think somebody is. And usually, usually, here's the deal. Somebody that we think is great, we're probably just idolizing them. Uh, <clears throat> I always get nervous when I hear more than two people start talking highly about me. I mean, I really do. I, I'm not just joking about that. I get nervous because I know that God is capable of bringing me down in the eyes of those people. And usually when he does, it's not just in the eyes of those three people. It's in the eyes of everybody, you know. I know he can do that and will do that. Not because I'm mean or bad or terrible, but because he doesn't want us putting our trust in man or idolizing somebody or thinking more highly of them than we are. And all those are basically scriptures, you know. He doesn't want that. He wants us, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Okay? So, in, in God's dealing, since he wants his son and he recognizes greatness as the son because he recognizes that greatness doesn't have to have the approval of everybody, True greatness does not, I mean, that's a, that's, that's a weird thing. True greatness does not have to have the approval of everybody. True greatness, especially in the, in the kingdom of God, is as long as the Father's pleased, I'm okay. Now, that's a great phrase. That's a great phrase, and I've said it uh, for a lot of years. Um, but I've also gone through a lot of personal anguish that I didn't have to go through because I wanted someone other than Jesus to approve me, even if it was just one other person. <laughs> you know, just give me one, Lord. You know, that's what you feel like. But the concepts, when they're shared in a classroom setting, sound beautiful. They sound heavenly. They sound, but when you're there and people are against you and people are you know, raising up clubs and want to come kill you. And not just, folks, not just because you are such a man of God or woman of God, 
but because in their mind you become a criminal. I, I was talking with somebody about this recently. Um, there was a movie with, uh, what's the, the black guy with the ears? Uh, Will Smith. Will Smith uh, and it was the most, it was the most recent movie. Do you know what's the most, the most recent movie? Uh, is it seven pounds? Seven pounds. And the whole deal was is that this guy gave his organs away to people so that they could live. In other words, he died so they could live. Okay, uh, there was another movie. I don't recommend it for the language, but I'll just tell you it's uh, Gran Torino. And at the end, he gives his life so others will not be hassled and so that they can live. So the okay. Well, that's not good. Thank you for spoiling two movies. And this this most recent one that is out now. <laughs> And here's the deal. We watch those movies and we get a small taste. Even someone who's not born again gets a small taste of what Christ is like. But there's a difference. It's not true. It's not real. It is not genuine. It's not the genuine article unless that person, in all, like all those movies, unless they have become a criminal, they are looked at as a horrible person. Information has been given everyone about them so that their act is not glorious or beautiful. Did you understand what I just said? There is, we look at those men and we go, oh, oh, so, folks, you'll never see that with Jesus. Not, not Jesus when he walked this earth and laid down his life and not Jesus and anyone else. Folks, the worst scum and junk is going to be said about them. The worst uh, about Christ. It's all that they are will be laid on him. And then it doesn't look beautiful to anyone. You know what it looks like? That scum deserved to die. Did you know that? And if it doesn't come to that, then there hasn't been a true sacrifice. Because, you know, the example I've always given over the years is if Jesus is walking up to Calvary and the streets are lined with people and they're all going, go, Jesus, go, you die for us. Oh, glory to you. You go, man. We're with you. We're, you know. Then Jesus is going, yeah, hi, thank you, thank you, you know. Right? I mean, anybody can do that. You know, I mean, not everybody would, but many would, you know. But when they're throwing stuff and they're cursing him and they're spitting on him and stuff like that, you know. And folks, only Jesus is going to handle that, see. But when, when it can happen, that's true greatness. That's true greatness. Okay, that's true greatness. Because maybe nobody will know but the Father. And are we genuinely okay with that? And again, this is great to talk about all this in a classroom setting. I, I did it for years. I remember going, oh, it's all so beautiful and glorious until I was in the situation. And then when the scum is heaped on you and, and everybody's pointing a finger, will you stand with the Lord? Will you be okay that the Father, at least, you know, I mean, this, the phrase is said, <laughs> well, at least the Father knows. But is it really enough? Is it really enough? Yes. Only if it's Christ in you. That's exactly the answer. So, let me just say this to you. Greatness in the eyes of the Father and the greatness that the Father is working toward is not as we understand it. Because here's, here's our thought. I remember when I was a newborn Christian, we were a bunch of hippies. And I remember we're sitting around in a circle, you know, in an apartment, you know, we're playing and singing and stuff. And, and somebody made a wonderful statement. They said, oh, my God, I just had a flash. Why don't we all start praying that Mick Jagger gets saved? And we said, oh, man, if Mick Jagger got saved, 
it just, everybody would come to God. <laughs> well, it would be a big deal <laughs> if you know Mick Jagger. But, but from there, I began to watch things and people, and I began to realize that, that we have this concept that the greater the person is, the greater glory that Jesus gives. And is that true? Is that really true? In other words, Jesus' greatness is gauged by ours? Is that even, I mean, that could even border on blasphemy. <laughs> that his greatness is only to the measure that we become great? And I'm talking about known and prestige and honor and all that stuff. Well, that's ridiculous. And yet I've seen people on TV, Christian TV, sitting there and saying, you know, well, you know, I've used all my wealth and all my power and all my, you know, to, to glorify the Lord. You know, no. If you're going to glorify the Lord, you're going to have to live the life of Christ. And the rich young ruler, my God, folks, he was rich. He was young. He was a ruler. And Jesus said, well, no, this isn't any big deal. Just give away everything. Come follow me. And then, you know, we'll, we'll get into greatness. No, man. Can you imagine? He's probably thinking, I, forget him. Some of the disciples are thinking, Jesus, what are you doing? This guy can really help the cause. Jesus is, Jesus is not moved by it at all. He is not moved by it one iota. In fact, he's saying, you need to get rid of your greatness and come into a new kind of greatness, a cross greatness, a self-giving greatness, one that lays down its life and can be like the scapegoat, blamed and covered with shame and still live for God and still love God with all your heart. I'm telling you. That's, that's when you're moving into true greatness. Well, the rich young ruler couldn't do that. Why? Well, he was too rich. He was too young. He was too powerful. <laughs> All of the things that we think would bring glory to God are actually the things, you know, what's it say? God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the base things of the world to confound those that are, you know, that are something, the noble, you know, the, the noble ones, the... And, and all of this is based on primarily one thing, that in God's eyes, greatness is not defined by how well you do, up, how far you climb up the ladder, how well you're honored, how well, which, folks, that flies right in the face of modern-day Christianity. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Not only that, but they'll talk about how well they're doing. Um, I remember, and this is the honest truth, I've had people, I've had pastors come up to me and we get to talking and stuff, and they start talking about their ministry and all this stuff. And he says, Well, how's your ministry doing? I said, Well, you know, a bunch of people are up in arms, people are slandering me, things are going you know, pretty bad and everything, but uh, you know, but but a lot of us, a lot of us have our eyes on Jesus. We just love the Lord, and, that, and it was like they went, "Dude, you must not be right with God." That's the thought. I mean, the thought is, and I, folks, I'm not saying this for me. I'm saying this for you. You're gonna face this, okay? I mean, you can think I'm talking about me or something right now. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about what's going to happen to you and where you're going to stand when it happens. I'm trying to help you. I've been through some stuff. <laughs> and I'm telling you that with your little precious pure heart for Jesus and your desire to see him glorified, if long as you've got the world's view of how to do that, then your world is eventually going to come crushing, crumbling down around your ankles. Because you're going to think that all of this that I produced is what's bringing glory to God. And he's going to say, the real way I want to see you bring glory to me is my son in you 
when you are accused and you are cast out and thought evil of. And Jesus said that. He says, when men think evil of you, bless and curse not. And da, da, da. Well, why would he say that? When men think evil of you, when people, you know, um, maliciously abuse you and stuff like that, why would he say that stuff if the real plan of God was to make you great and wonderful in the eyes of the people so he would get more glory? Why would he even mention that stuff? Well, I'll tell you why. Because he wants his son in us. And if it's, again, if, it's, if it is the son, you'll go through it. You can go through it. If it's not the son, and there were portions of things that I went through where it wasn't the son, it was me. It was excruciating to my flesh and my soul. My soul was going, I hate this. But when it's the son, you go... Father, you know, he, I mean, he said, he said stuff like this. He said, um, blessed are you when men persecute you and throw out your name as evil and say all manner of evil. Come on, folks. How many of you have had all manner of evil spoken of you? Well, just about. <laughs> I mean, you know. And, and, you know, he said, Rejoice and be exceedingly joyful, for so did the prophets before you. And when it's me, I try that, but it doesn't work. I go, I'm not, you know, I'm trying to even get it to my throat. Look, hallelujah, you know, and I go, this sucks, man. I, <laughs> I do not like this. This hurts. This is miserable to me. Well, I'm not the Lamb of God, but you know what? The Lamb is supposed to live in me. And you want to glorify the Father? The greatest glory you can bring him is when you allow Christ to live in you in those situations. And I'm telling you, this is the honest truth. There is a place that you can get to that he will carry you through that and you will be with the Lord, spirit, soul, and body. So, you say... Why do you tell me all this stuff? I don't even want to be in ministry then. You know? Yeah. Well, I'm telling you there's a place in the Lord that can carry you through this, and it'll be bring glory to God. Did you have a statement back there? Amen. Uh, verse 28 says, um, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, Jesus is saying, It shall not be so among you, for whosoever be great among you, let him become, as it were, the least, even as... When I came, I didn't come to be ministered unto, but to minister and give my life a ransom. All right. Again, classroom setting. Wonderful stuff. Wonderful stuff. But what about this? What about when that same life in you has come not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give its life as a ransom? Um, then you get into situations where after years of this, years of this, then somebody says, well, you know, you just need to go apologize. And you say, I always apologize. There's more. <laughs> you say, well, you just need to, you know, you just need to, to give your life. I always give my, that, and 
couch behind that is they never give their life. Okay? This is all pertaining to this. this is, these are nice, sweet sayings until life hits, reality hits. And then when you're in the middle of this, this is how you translate it down. It's like having a sieve here and pouring these scriptures in there. And when you shake it down and bring it down to what it is, it's down to every time you're the one that has the given life. You've got Christ and you're the one that apologizes. You're the one that gives yourself. You're the one that lays down your life. You're the one that takes the loss. And you say, well, I do, I've been doing this for 10, 15 years. When is somebody else going to? Well, according to this, never. You are the one that he called to be conformed to the image of his son. And again, these things are not grievous. My commandments are not grievous when you have the life of Christ that fulfill those commandments. They are incredibly grievous if you're going to try to do it. Now, there is a period of time where it can be Christ for many years, and then all of a sudden you get fed up. Anybody ever been fed up before? I have. I have. You get fed up, and you say stuff like that, and I understand that. I'm not being critical when I even use these examples. I'm just telling you, you know what I mean? I mean, there's no nothing behind me you know, malicious or looking down on someone that would say this because I've probably done it more than you, okay? So I don't, I'm, I'm tender-hearted toward those who go through this. But I'm telling you that if it's not Christ, we will go through this and we will say stuff like that. We'll, we, we will just go, man, my God, I'm always the one that has to give in or I'm always the one that has to do this or I'm all, it's like this, I'm always the one that, that has to minister and not get ministered unto Well, let's see. Didn't we nod our heads and say goody goody over that scripture at one point in our walk? That's because we didn't really understand what it was talking about. It was all pie in the sky, other stuff. Yes? Right. Well, in maybe some cases it wasn't. Maybe in some cases it wasn't Jesus, it was us. Because, I mean, it's easy to get fed up when, it, you're, when you're laying down your life. You know, it's time for someone else to lay down their life, you know. I remember when I was first learning this, I, I actually was still in Bible school when the Holy Spirit started trying to bring some of the reality of it to me. And I, I was sitting there, and uh, spring... Uh, spring break came, and this, this has absolutely nothing to do with any Bible school students here. Nothing. But spring break came, and um, uh, they said, well, what are you doing for spring break? And I, I said, they said, we're going home and stuff, and we're going to go out and have fun and all this stuff. And I said, well, I'm going to stay here and with the book, I had a roommate that had a lot of really good books and stuff. I'm going to stay here and not have all the pressure of having to get up early in the morning and work all day and do the ministry and be in classes and stuff like that. And I'm just going to get in the Word and soak and saturate for a while. And they said, D you know, don't you want a break? Don't you need a break from all this? And I said, all this what? You mean, do I need a break from Jesus? I mean, that was the, that's what it felt. I, do you need a break from living for God, serving God, you know? I mean, the thought came to me, do I need a break from Jesus? And what is considered the Lord and what is considered following the Lord? Oh, I need a break from following the Lord. I need to go out and party for three, three or four days. At least. You know what I'm saying? You know? I just... No, I don't need a break from Jesus. I need a long, extended break from Randy. I need a divorce. I need a death. I need the end of my flesh saying that, and see, here's, here's the deal. I knew that my flesh needed a break.
but the problem was that I knew there was too much of my flesh involved in the situation. That's why I needed a break. Now, let me say this too. If I'm the director and all that kind of stuff, you, it's good for you, it's healthy to take breaks. If you had a job and you worked for a full day, you should have a lunch break and a 15 minute break in the morning and in the afternoon. And I, I would like for you to be healthy and, and do all of that stuff. So I'm all for that. So I want you to know that I'm not some sort of an Egyptian taskmaster just driving you, which is ridiculous to even think that that'd be the case around here with the way things are run. <laughs> Um, but, but I am saying that when I was in that situation, I looked at myself and I went, there's too much flesh here because my flesh is wanting a break. And if it was Christ formed in me, I wouldn't want a break from Jesus. I, it would be Jesus. And I would always be about ministering unto and not wanting to, everything to stop and come minister to me. right? We're not all there yet. Christ is not formed in everyone yet. But I, so then why do I say these things? There's got to be some kind of standard somewhere. Somebody's got to raise the bar above, you know, suck your thumb and try the best you can. You know what I mean? I mean, my God, you know, compared to the life of Christ and to what Jesus will bring forth in a vessel totally given to God you know who was one of the one of the fathers from years ago said it has yet to be seen what God can do through a vessel that is totally given to God well the way most Christians live it's it's going to be yet to be seen for a long time unless somebody takes that personally and says then why not me why not now why not in this vessel why not me test this out and see if Christ can't be formed into a vessel to such a degree that greatness, the Father is glorified by the greatness of someone who continually ministers, lays down their life by Christ, of course, and glorifies the Father in that instead of once an escape from it. It's just a thought. I mean, again, I just think somebody has to at least... You know, even if I don't set the standard, somebody needs to talk about it. That there is much more to this than what we even allow for. Now, if I were you and I was thinking about being involved in ministry in the future or starting a ministry of any kind or being, you know, expanding, my, uh, and I will say this, this is probably the last class on this subject right here I'm going to teach. So next week I'll do Psalms and that'll be it. <clears throat> so in just a few minutes, you'll be free from this, this class. But if I was facing this, if I was facing the possibility of a future ministry, man, I would just start praying. I would say, God, I believe all those things potentials are there of being faced with with continually ministering and getting no credit of, of being of being slimed and scummed and and accused by a bunch of people and yet it not be true and yet you'll be the only one I have to hold on to and so father right now I'm asking you and every day that I wake up in the morning I want to just say to you or whatever before I go to bed at night Father, form your son in me to this end that you can be glorified, to this end that you, your greatness can be seen in an earthen vessel, this earthen vessel. Lord, so that your life will carry me through this so that, you know, I mean, it, folks, it was no piece of cake for Jesus. I mean, he sweat great drops of blood. But, by the, but he got some things settled in the Garden of Gethsemane. Can I get amen? And when he went on the cross, there was no more, Father, save me, or, you know, it's like, Father, forgive them. Didn't he appear like everything was cool between him and the Father in the sense of, of I'm with God, and I'm going to go through this to the glory of God. Didn't basically it appear that way? You know, I know that there's the, 
my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But still, there was, for the most part, he was with the Lord. They offered him the vinegar and wine so that it would uh, dull his senses so that he wouldn't have to go through it. He turned it down. I'm with the Father. I don't need out external things. That was by life. You understand? That's life. That's, that's living. And that's what you'll need. And, and the time to, you know, I've often said this, you know, the devil shoots fiery darts, right? And we're supposed to have our shield of faith up. I mean, you don't have the devil go and shoot all these fiery darts and then they go and hit you and then you go, you know, then you start lifting your, sword, your, your shield, you know, right? Or, you know, most don't have a shield yet. We've got to go, oh, God, give me faith. Oh, Lord, you know, I mean, that's when we start looking for faith is when we're hit. Folk, the shield of faith ought to be up and, and action before the darts come. But we're all, you know, we're all just like, doo, doo, doo. Poof, poof, I'm hit. Lord, build my faith. You know, it's going to take two months to build your faith. You know, you'll look like a pin cushion before this is over with. You know, all the fiery darts stuck in you. <clears throat> this is the time to be praying and saying, God, I want you glorified. I want your son to be able to live through me. And I want to be able to be carried through this by the life of Christ. So that, so that I don't get into the fiery trial and then think it's strange. <laughs> you know, well, this is weird. I thought everything was going to be good. Everything in this class has told you it's going to take Jesus. And everything in this class has told you if you truly want to glorify God in your ministry, it needs to be Christ in you that's the hope of glory. And, and knowing that is not enough. What you need to do from this point on is pray, Father, form your son in me. Father, you've probably before I was born knew me, before I was born had a destiny for me. Whatever that destiny is, whatever that calling is, Lord, I'm asking for something beyond that. I'm asking for the life of the Son to fill me and glorify you through that and be able to carry me through the hard times and through the, the good times and, you know. And, and to regularly pray that and not wait till you're way down the road and in trouble you know and if you do that I believe that many of the things we've talked about you know uh, what, were, what were some of those things obscurity uh, the test of obscurity the test of menial tasks the test of the must, mundane the test of worsening conditions I believe that if you do that all those tests will not, none of them will knock you down. And, and um, and just to give you another side, because uh, how much time we got left? About two minutes. Okay. Just to give you another side here. We think that doing without financially and not being known, and all of that is the big test. But I'm here to tell you that prosperity and being known and having the weight of that and living Jesus through all of that is just as big a test as the other. Uh, I heard a man say that for every, uh, well, he said, my version's a little different, but he said, for every, for every man that fails because of, let's see if I can get it right, because of, uh, uh, oh, there's a, a better word. For every man that fails because of hard times, because of lack, eight men fail because of prosperity. And the proof of that is these, these people that win these big uh, lotteries and stuff like that, 
You trace the history, the ones that they'll, they'll even let you know about. You trace the history, and most of their lives are ruined after that. I'm telling you, and many of them are back in poverty. They didn't know how to handle prosperity. They didn't know how to handle that, you know. I mean, I'm willing to try, but the Lord doesn't seem to be leading me in that direction. But I mean, <laughs> you know. But I mean, we think that we're the ones in the trial, and they're not. We don't see that as a trial. We see what we're in as a trial. But maybe God put you in the trial you're in because he knows you really couldn't handle that one. And when I say handle that, I don't just mean mishandle money. I mean mistreat people, look down on people, not, not share with people, not use your money for the kingdom of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a lot of stuff that goes on in a person that you don't even face when you're down and out, you know. And so um, just just trying to get you to realize the bottom line is man we need christ formed in us and we're not going to make it through prosperity or through hard times unless christ is formed in us and asking him to change our circumstances to make them better is not the answer um i i, I think of uh, was it hezekiah that that got sick and was going to die and god told the prophet tell him you're going to die and he prayed and said, Lord, don't let me die. Give me 15 more years. And God gave him 15 more years, and in that time, he had a son named Manasseh. Anybody know who Manasseh is? He was a horrible, horrible king that really turned all of Israel against God. And if he'd have died, there never would have been a Manasseh. But, but no, not us, man. No, no, give me, you know, you know, give me 15 more years, you know because I want to live. God knows. God knows these things. God's in control. God sees a picture we don't see. We have to trust God. We have to believe that whether by life or death, that Christ may be glorified in us. Anyway, I, I hope this class has been a blessing to you. Um, This class was a, a sneaky way of just bringing the cross in for all of us so that we can realize we need the Lord. And our future needs to be full of the Lord. And, and uh, Chris and I were talking, you know, if you're gaining momentum back, don't just be praying for now, though. Be praying for what's going to come down the road. Pray for where you're at then. Pray that God will have set your pace in your growth and in your stride to be able, when you hit stride with God, that your spirit is in stride too and that it's Christ formed in you. Every one of us want to be in stride with God. The only way, the only way that's going to happen in truth is if we give ourselves to prayer right now and, and, and God's destiny and our spiritual level matches when they hit. Because if it doesn't, and we're, our spiritual level's down here and where he's got us in ministry is, is up here, we're going to blow the whole thing and we're going to end up falling flat on our face. We want the Lord. We need, and, and that's not going to just magically happen up here somehow in the future. I'll be much better then. I'll be much more in tune. I'll be... <laughs> You will because you pray, because you plead with God. I don't want to go any further in ministry unless it's your son. So, Father, do whatever you have to do in the, in the circumstances and to bring forth Christ so that I will be in tune with you. And when you're in tune with him, you can go through anything. When you're not in tune, it's not good. So that's why we pray, that I may be in tune with you. That it, and that means him increasing and us decreasing. All right, let's stand together and we'll just close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we just ask you to take our destiny and our future in your hands right now. And Lord, that you will hear our cry and that you will move in such a manner that we will be in tune with you, that we will not fail because we're arguing over who's going to be the greatest. 
or arguing that someone else is made great and we're not, but that we can be great as you understand it, not the world, and that we can be grateful to be the least and to carry that in the right spirit, that we can be one with your son when all manner of evil is set against us falsely, and yet we know that you want your son, but Father, we will not react the proper way unless we pray now, and so we ask and we pray, Lord, prepare us, spirit, soul, and body. Prepare us for the destiny that you have. Prepare us for the future that you have. And Father, I pray right now for each and everyone who listens to this or watches this or, or those that are in the room now, Lord, that you will quicken them to pray on a regular basis along these lines, that they will not be passive, that they will not just assume things will fall in place. Lord, even, even Daniel, when he heard about, he read in the book of Jeremiah about the 70 years almost being up. Father, he set himself with prayer and fasting to pray for the thing you already said that would happen in the word. Father, may we be diligent to join with you to pray and to intercede on behalf of the future, on behalf of those lives that we touch and on behalf of the life that we demonstrate at those times. We look to you, Father. Qu quicken each one on a regular basis. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're dismissed.